Ah, good. Thank you, Brandon, and thank you, uh, music team, for leading us this morning. Last week uh, was kickoff Sunday, and we had a fantastic start to our, our school year, if you will. Um, so many people showed up. It was great to have service outdoors, and I would love it if we could have outdoor service uh, throughout the year. Uh, but I guess that just won't happen here, at least in a few weeks. Um, we started a brand new series last week, uh, a teaching series based upon a life group teaching that we did uh, with our life group leaders. Uh, about four or five years ago, and that material was taught by Rick Warren. Uh, Many of you are familiar with Rick Warren, Uh, but there was such a positive response to that Life Group Leaders training time, uh, encouraging me to do something like that and teach something like that uh, from a Sunday morning perspective so that we could all get in on that. Uh, And so that's really what we're doing uh, here in the next uh, few weeks. Um, We're going to be talking about community. Uh, However, I hope we're not just going to be talking about community or that I will just be talking about community. I hope that we'll be living out community and living in community with one another and that uh, we would grow in that aspect in our lives as a church family, uh, that we would learn to to live in community with one another. Uh, Because so often what we hear in our society uh, is happiness is about independence, independence. financial independence and relational independence that I don't need anybody else in my life because I can do this on my own and we have kind of this lone ranger mentality Uh, and yet sadly what we find over and over again is that the suicide rates continue to increase and so obviously the key to happiness is not independence but interdependence that we need one another that we're wired for relationships uh, that we belong to one another that we're wired to live in community with each other. And uh, last week, I gave you one reason why we need each other, and that was that we need one another to walk with each other in life. That when we walk together with other believers in our lives, that it's, uh, it's safer, it's supportive, and it's also smarter when we walk together through life with one another. Uh, And and one of the things that I said last week uh, was this, that this is a crowd, okay? This is good. It is so encouraging to see one another. It is good to see familiar faces, faces that we haven't, haven't seen for a while. And there is a level of encouragement here when we gather together in a crowd but we only get a few minutes to talk to each other. Maybe before the service or before Sunday school or after the service for a little bit. Uh, but it's in a life group where we can create that community, where we can be known and we can also know others as well. I love it that Steinbeck EMC, SEMC is known as a welcoming place. Uh, I hear that in the community. And what I'd love for us to do is to grow not just in our welcoming, but grow in our intimacy with one another. Uh, I like to define intimacy as this, into me you see, okay, intimacy, that we would grow in our intimacy in relating to one another. And what we talked about last week was that community is God's answer to loneliness. And so that's the first reason why we encourage you to get involved in a life group, to to walk alongside of other people and so that other people can walk alongside you as well. And what I challenged us, what I would encourage us to do last week was that you would think about between now and Christmas that everyone as a part of SEMC, 100% of us would get together in a group if we're not in a group already to get involved in a life group. And I'm not asking you to commit for the rest of your lives together with this group, but even for the next 12 to 13 weeks to get together on a regular basis so that we can learn about community. Oh, perhaps that community, that sense of group, would continue on after that. But commit for the next 12 to 13 weeks to get into a life group if you're not in one already. What that means is a life group of of, of just three or four people Uh, You can start with your friends, right? Start a group. And what I'd love for you to do is to invite three or four friends and uh, people that you know, and you just get involved and say, hey, we're going to meet regularly together. 
to encourage one another, to help each other grow in our lives together. If you're already in a group, I would love it if you'd shoot me a text or an email or, or, or give me a call and let me know who's in your group and when you're meeting. I'd love to hear about that, who's connected with who. And if you're starting a group, if you would let me know that too. Who are the people that you're going to meet with on a regular basis? Uh, what, I, what we've done last week and did today, and we want to do this in the, in the weeks to come, is we want to put a couple questions for you in the bulletin. Uh, in the sermon notes, you have sermon notes on one, ha- on one page or one side of the page. On the other side is a couple questions. And if you take that insert out and you look at the questions on the back there, you will notice this. If you're a small group leader, you do not have to have a seminary degree to lead a small group. Okay? You don't need to know Hebrew. You don't need to know Greek to lead a life group. Okay? I know that that's one of the reservations sometimes we have in leading a life group. I won't have all the answers. That's good. Because if you have all the answers, I will get a little bit skeptical. Right? But we need one another to walk with us in life. And so that was the first one last week. Today I want to give you a couple more why we need each other. The second one would be this, is that we need others to work with us. The Bible says God has put us on this earth to, uh, for some special work that he has called us to do. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 in the New Living Translation, it says, for we are God's masterpiece. He has created us anew in Christ Jesus so that we can do the things that he planned for us long ago. Okay, a little side note here. Did you hear that? We are masterpieces. You hear that? You are a masterpiece. Oh, in fact, I, I, you know what? I'm wondering if we could try something this morning. And, and I call this kind of the Christian wave, the church wave. I wonder if we could start on this side of the building, okay, right at the wall, and you turn to the person to your left, and you say, you are a masterpiece. Okay, go ahead, and, and so because we are wearing masks, you may have to use your outside voice inside, and that's okay, right? Especially if you're on the aisle, because you have to shout it across, okay? So let's try this. Starting on the left side, right, you're going to say, you are a masterpiece, okay? And then we're going to transfer it all the way down the rows. Okay, Woo. Okay. now we're going to start on this side. Because these people, right? You are God's masterpiece. Now you're going to spread it this way. Go ahead. <laughs> you are a masterpiece. Now I want us all to say, I am a masterpiece. Okay? One, two, three. I am a masterpiece. (laughs) Because that's what God calls you. I should end it right there. (laughs) We should just go home, right? (laughs) Too bad I got more to say. (laughs) Okay, listen, masterpieces. Before you were even born, God decided the natural abilities that he would give to each one of us here. There are some things that come easier to you than they do to other people. Right? There are some in this place here that, oh, music comes easy to you. Right? You can pick up an instrument and, and it just seems to come pretty easy for you. Right? Oh, you continue to work on that, but it comes fairly easy. Some of you are natural athletes and, and, and athletics of sports. They come easy to you. Others of you, you can fix things, right? You're mechanically inclined and you can look at any kind of engine problem and you go, oh, I got it, I can fix that, right? Others of you here, you can draw. You can see something, you can see a landscape and you can just start drawing and it just looks like exactly that landscape. Or you can paint. And those are some of the natural abilities that God has given you and he has said, here, use that natural ability and when you use that natural ability to serve others to minister to others ah you're doing the good works 
that I have called you to do. When you use those natural abilities to minister to somebody else, you're doing God's work. Listen, you all, we all are ministers when you use your natural abilities to serve other people. You're ministers. You're not all pastors, but you're all ministers. Okay? There's a difference. Right? And God tells us why we're supposed to work together using our gifts, using these abilities that he has given us. With it. In, in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verse 9, we read this. Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. You see, when we work together, when we use our gifts and abilities and we work together as a body of believers, right, we get to do far more than we could accomplish just by ourselves. Not only that, when we get to work alongside of one another, it's a whole lot more fun. Boy, last week, cleaning up, setting up, you got to do that together with other people and it was lots of fun. We got to use our gifts and abilities and we got to work together. And there's all sorts of benefits when we work together as a body. Every single one of us here has a part to play. And if we do our parts, we can accomplish lots together. I heard somebody say this, that snowflakes are weak. But if enough of them stick together, they can stop traffic. Think about that, snowflakes, right? Together, we can make a big difference when we work together. Community is God's answer to weakness. There is strength when we work together. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 6, verse 10, Therefore, whenever we have opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially to those in the family of faith. What's the family of faith? That's our church family. That's us, right here. We're, we're, we're part of a church family together. And I have been so blessed by the church family as I hear stories okay, about how life groups have pitched in and have stepped in. I've heard many stories from many of you about how when you have faced setbacks, when you've experienced crisis in your life, when you've experienced health issues in your life, when you've experienced discouragement in your life, how your life group has stepped in and brought encouragement your way. Maybe that encouragement was through a meal. Maybe that encouragement was visiting in the hospital. Maybe that encouragement was just being present as you cried together. And I love hearing those stories about how life groups are working together and the church family is working together to encourage and build each other up. We need each other to walk with us through life and we need people to work together with us. A third thing is this, that we need one another in each other's lives because we need to watch out for one another as well. What we mean by that is, is this, that we need to have people in our life that would have our back. Uh, people who will defend us, who will stand up for us. People who will help us stay on track. Who will warn us. Who will speak into our lives truthfully and lovingly. Because every single one of us has blind spots in our lives. And we need people to speak into our lives in that way. In Ephesians, or sorry, Philippians chapter 2, verse 4, I love how the New Living Translation uh, reads. It says this, Don't look out only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. And I read that verse, and I think, man, that is so countercultural. You want to live a countercultural life? Then live this verse out in your life. Because it's not just about me. I mean, imagine that. If that was our attitude, we took an interest in others' lives. I mean, how would that change our homes? How would that change our, our, our churches, our, our workplaces, our, 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 our community, our city that we live in? Our family, we live in a great neighborhood. Uh, we like our neighbors. Uh, I don't know if our neighbors like us. Um, but we love our neighbors. We love getting to know them, and, and maybe it's gone a little bit slower than we would like, but we love our neighbors, and when we go on holidays, and when we went on holidays this summer, 
We went to our neighbors and we said, hey, listen, we're going to be gone for a couple weeks. Uh, do you mind just kind of watching over our stuff? you mind just kind of looking out for our house? You don't let us know if anything kind of suspicious is happening on, uh, there. Um, and we do the same for them. That's just part of being in a, a good neighbor, part of being in a good neighborhood together. Uh, we want our stuff to be looked after. But my question for us this morning is do you have somebody looking out for your heart? Because your heart is more important than your home. Who do you got watching out for your spiritual well-being? Have you let somebody come into your life to get close enough to you, someone who actually knows the blind spots in your life, and you've given them permission to speak into your life? Someone who would see a blind spot and, and they would speak encouraging and truthfully to you, even though it's going to sting sometimes to hear that. Because we have blind spots. And we need one another. Hebrews chapter th- uh, 13, verse 1. It says, Keep being concerned about each other as the Lord's followers should. Okay? This is not talking about gossiping and sharing a juicy prayer request. That's not what it's talking about here. But to be concerned for your friends, to be concerned for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we need each other. We're family. We're we're God's family. And as brothers and sisters, we need to get each other's backs. We need to defend one another. We need to help one another stay on track. Keep being concerned. Don't give up being concerned for one another. Don't give up being concerned about each other's well-being. Why? Because we have a spiritual enemy. Yeah, the devil wants to mess us up. He would love nothing more than to ruin our relationships. And he wants to hurt us bad. Why? Because he can't hurt God. And so when he can't hurt God, what does he do? He goes after God's children. And the devil would love nothing more than to mess up our lives through addictions, through habits, habits that we can't break, through offense, through hurts, and he'll just keep pumping that. Yeah, don't let go of that bitterness. Don't let go of that resentment. Don't let go of that offense. And he'll just want to keep feeding us that. He wants us to hold on to that bitterness. He wants us to hold on to that resentment as we go through life. And what I see so often is so many Christians live defeated lives because we try to fight the enemy on our own. We need other people in our lives who will watch out for us. Let me put a little plug in here for Freedom in Christ. Uh, there are sessions that we have run a number of times over the last few years and we're hoping again to, to lead them soon again. But in these sessions, it really tackles and, and, and deals with a lot of the offense, a lot of the hurts, a lot of the resentment and the bondage uh, that we live under because we don't want to let go of these maybe addictions or these hurts. And so Freedom in Christ teaches you and gives you the tools to be able to see some of these things in your own life and to release them, to forgive, so that we can live in the freedom and the victory that is ours in Christ Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 12 says, A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. See, that's a small group. He says, watch out for one another. Have each other's back. And so what I would ask is, who's got your back? Who's looking out for your spiritual welfare? Are you in a life group? Guys with, with, with a number of other guys? Ladies with, with a number of other ladies? Or couples together with other couples? People who are there that are saying, hey, you know what? I know you're going through a difficult time, but I'm going to stand with you. I'm going to walk with you through this. I'm not going to let you get discouraged. I'm not going to let you give up. But I'm going to walk with you through this. 
Because if we don't have those types of people in our lives, it's like we have a big bullseye on our back for the devil. Community is God's answer to defeat. Again in Ecclesiastes 4, and I read the, uh, verse 9 earlier, t- two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. Verse 10 says this, if either of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. See, life groups are based upon that principle of being able to walk together, to be able to help each other, to get it back up and to keep walking. There's a fourth reason why we need one another, and that is we need somebody to wait with us and to weep with us. We need people to wait with us when we're waiting for bad news. And we need people to weep with us when we hear the bad news. We need people there when the inevitable crisis and tragedies will come in our lifetime because we don't want to face those alone. There are situations in our lives where we should never have to face alone. Nobody should ever have to wait. In the hospital while a loved one is going through life and death surgery. No one should have to stand on an open grave or over an open grave by themselves. Nobody should have to spend that first night alone after their spouse has passed away. Nobody should have to spend the night alone when their spouse has just walked out on them. Nobody. Nobody. The fact is, some of these things will happen to us. Inevitably, crisis and tragedy will come our way. We need other people in our lives. And the time to build the support system around us is now, not in that moment. You see, that's what life groups are about. A group of believers who are committed to walk with one another to do life together. You know, when you're in the hospital, you probably don't want all 400 people to show up. Right? That might be a little bit awkward. But it sure would be great if a small group of friends would come by. Pop in, just say, I'm praying for you. Love you. That's a life group. Community is God's answer to discouragement. Romans chapter 12, verse 15 in the New Living Translation says, be happy with those who are happy. Weep with those who weep. That's what happens in a life group. Something good happens, right? You get to celebrate a promotion at work. Uh, you graduate. You get a new house or a new car and, and you, you want people around you to celebrate. And, and, and so we party together when good things like that can happen to us. We have some fun together, but there are times in our life when we are going through a tough time and we need people around us that will weep with us. In fact, sometimes in small groups that we've been part of, sometimes it gets a little bit uncomfortable if maybe there's some tears that are shed and we go, well, what what do we do in that time? Uh, My suggestion would be that when there's tears, there's an opportunity to stop and pray. That's a good signal. To stop and pray. So we need people to walk with us, work with us, to watch out for us, to wait and to weep with us. And then we need others to witness with us. Matthew 28, Jesus was speaking and, and it's known as the Great Commission. But he said this, Jesus came to his, to his disciples and he told them this, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, Go. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you and be sure of this, that I am with you always to the end of the age. You see this? This is disciples making disciples. 
Jesus told the disciples to go and make disciples. How do we make disciples? We teach others as well to obey the commands of Jesus. You're a disciple of Jesus. Our role is to go and make disciples. Jesus told us to go and make disciples. Love that. Teach the disciples to obey everything I have commanded. That's why God has put us on this earth. That's our mission. That's our co-mission. Right? God didn't mean for us to do this alone. He said, do this together. In fact, you see Jesus' style, how he did it. He would send out his disciples two by two, and he would say, go. Go together. Right? Ah, it's so good to witness together with one another. In fact, you know what the best way is that we, as Christ followers, can witness to the world around us? God says it is by loving each other. Love others in the family of God. John chapter 13, verse 35, Jesus said this, your love for one another will prove to the world that you're my disciples. You know what's going to impress the community around us, the city around us? those who who don't attend church, who've never been to church, who don't know a thing about God or Jesus, what's going to impress them most is when Christians, when believers love each other. Wouldn't that be great? We're here in the community. You know what impresses me most, most about Steinbeck EMC? You see how they love one another? Those people know how to love each other really, really well. And so we witness together by our love. Community is God's answer to fear. We need one another. We need others to walk with us, to work with us, to watch over us, to weep and to wait with us, to witness with us. You see, of all the people that God could choose to be here this morning, He chose you. He chose me to be here today. He chose us to be part of SEMC. Why? Because he wants us to be involved. He wants us to be involved in creating a loving community that would turn this city upside down. That our love for one another would show our community that we are followers of Jesus Christ. And so I pray for us as a church family that our love for each other would continue to grow And that in our love for one another, it would be infectious to our surrounding community. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, I pray for a revolution of love and fellowship and community here. Father, it begins in our hearts. Father, I pray that you would cause a spiritual awakening in my heart and in the heart of your church here at SEMC and in our city. Father, I need that reawakening. We need it. Our city needs it. Father, forgive me when there are times and for the times in my life where I felt like I didn't need other people in my life. God, I want to be a part of what you're doing in your family, in your church. Father, I too want to experience real community to really love and to be loved in a much deeper way. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this place, for SEMC. I thank you for this place where we can gather and we can grow and we can go together. And so, Father, I pray that we wouldn't just settle for being passive followers, but that you would fan into flame our hearts so that they would burn bright and they would burn hot. Father, I would ask that you would bless our church family so that we in turn could be a blessing to our neighbors. That we would bless them in increasing measure. I ask this in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.